Okay, so we're going to get started this afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody to our lecture this afternoon. It's a special day today because you get two for the price of one. Uh, we've got two speakers, uh, um, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Maxim Bornoff and Dr. Dirk de Klerk. Uh, they research uh, um, together uh, and uh, they'll be doing a, a split presentation today. So we're going to start with Maxim and then move to Dirk and then uh, back to, to uh, Maxim um, uh, in a few minutes. So with that, uh, welcome everybody. Unfortunately, uh, today we don't have the live webcasting feed, uh, but the presentation will be videotaped and posted on the Covey website. So um, if you know of people that were planning on logging in today, they can certainly still get the presentation uh, as of tomorrow. And we apologize for that uh, uh, glitch today. Our first speaker, Maxim Voronov, is an assistant professor from uh, strategic management in the Faculty of Business here at Brock University, and he's also one of our Covey Fellows, joined the Covey team uh, last year. He received his PhD from Columbia University, and his research spans the area of strategic development, organizational change, entrepreneurship, uh, and in, um, overall, he's also got a focus right now on the organization of the Ontario wine industry. Uh, his colleague, uh, Dr. Dirk de Klerk, uh, is an Associate Professor of Management in the Faculty of Business here at Brock and also joined us as a Covey Fellow last year. He teaches cor courses in entrepreneurship and research methodology. He received his PhD in Business Administration from the University of Minnesota. And he's also one of our Chancellor's Chairs here at Brock University. Uh, this is a Research Excellence Award. Uh, so we're we're very uh, fortunate to have uh, Dirk uh, as part of our team. Uh, his research spans the area of entrepreneurship, innovation, venture capital, and internationalization, and includes different industry settings, including the Ontario wine industry. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Maxim, and uh, we'll continue on. Well, uh, th th thank you very much, Debbie, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming out here, um, or joining us virtually. Um, so uh, this is, of course, this is a uh, research a collaboration with a number of colleagues. So of course, uh, Dirk and myself, um, and uh, some of the uh, part of the portions of the research that we will be discussing today are done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Narungsak Tak Tong Papano, uh, also at the business school, as well as uh, our colleague Bob Heinings at the University of Alberta, as well as uh, David Holly, who is uh, uh, who has held a number of roles here within the Ontario wine industry. So. Um, Something that I like to start with always is to just kind of put up uh, this little quote here from, um, from, uh, from uh, wine historian um, Angel Baird, um, who claims that the importance of Bordeaux wine is not based on climate, but on their better organization of marketing to Northern Europe. So, um, and I think it just sort of underscores a lot of the issues that, that uh, we're going to talk about today, the fact that, um, you know, it is obviously very important and crucial to make great wines, but it's also very important to um, organize the industry uh, for the business and wine in, in such a manner that it will in fact be acclaimed, accepted, and uh, sell. Right? So how did, we start, how did we start on this research? Well, um, our, the, the premise um, uh, that we started with is that wine, particularly premium and uh, ultra premium and super premium wines are essential cultural products. Right? People are no, they're not buying uh, you know, Bordeaux or Burgundy wines, for example, simply because, you know, they taste nice and all that, right? I mean, they also taste, they also buy them because of the story that is associated with those wines um, and uh, with the region and the, uh, you know, hundreds of years worth of history, etc. So people are buying all that when they're uh, buying such wines. And that's really the case for, uh, for any kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, pre premium wine. Right? So, so there is really the import, importance of symbolism is really paramount, and th this is what we're finding that that uh, the various wine regions uh, that are successful around the world are those you know, that um, have figured out a good way to cultivate the right kind of symbolism and communicate it well to the marketplace, um, you know, both domestically and internationally. Um, so, so um, therefore, what we wanted to to uh, find out when we started. Um, with this research is how is this what we call symbolic value this you know this specialness the sense of specialness that goes above and beyond what's in the bottle how is it created um, so 
uh, we asked what, uh, what stories are wineries telling. So that's, that's kind of one part of it, of course. You know, what, are the, what is it that the wineries are trying to communicate? And also, how do the various industry dynamics, things that are happening in the environment that is surrounding the wineries that wineries may have somewhat limited control over, how do those things uh, either help or hinder their ability to, to tell those stories? So, um, as, as we started on this research, uh, it, it occurred to us that a good idea um, is to go for depth rather than breadth. So what, oftentimes what happens in, um, in, in a lot of business research, uh, particularly dealing with emerging industries, is that uh, people take uh, ideas uh, and findings from a variety of um, industries and then just kind of import them to the industry that they wish to study. Um, and uh, we felt that uh, in order to be most beneficial to the entire wine industry, we really should get to know uh, the industry in depth and to really find out you know, what makes it tick. Um, and so we undertook a longitudinal uh, multi-year case study, so which is you know, stuff that we're, gonna, that we're gonna be talking to you about today is really um, part of the story. I mean, this is, this is ongoing research and, uh, and uh, um, you know, more data are being collected as we speak. Um, so, um, so part of, part of the research and most of the stuff that we'll be talking about today is qualitative. So interviews uh, with wineries, with wine writers, with restaurants, LCBO executives, uh, various trade group representatives, etc. cetera. Um, also uh, various documents uh, such as wineries' websites, uh, such as uh, their uh, email newsletters, uh, 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 popular press and blog coverage, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, we uh, analyze the field, uh, who are the various stakeholders, how they relate to each other, et cetera. Uh, and uh, the, no, not, of course, not to belabor the technicalities of this, but of course it, it's both inductive, meaning you know, growing from data, but also in, uh, deductive, kind of growing based on our emerging theory, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and the other part, is, and that's the, that's the stuff that, that, that uh, uh, Dirk will talk about, uh, is oh, there's also a quantitative component as well, uh, surveys of Ontario restaurants um, uh, that are an important stakeholder group that we wanted to understand in depth, um, and uh, so survey was warranted. So, in a in nutshell, just a really quick summary of some of the um, uh, key challenges. Uh, and, uh, and I will then talk uh, in more detail about those. Um, uh, of course, the really key challenge is um, determining the distinctive identity of Ontario wine, and that's something that we'll come back to over and over again, and that's really the overarching theme here. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, explaining uh, the identity to consumers uh, and, uh, and to other stakeholders, and also recognizing the fact um, that uh, all of this identity building stuff that we'll be talking about is, is a collective process. So it's not simply that wineries uh, come up with uh, the idea like, you know, Ontario wine is about this, uh, and uh, then they just go out and just tell it to everybody. It is a very much a collective process. So, for example, um, such, such uh, um, uh, stakeholders as restaurants, such re uh, stakeholders as Scavi, such stakeholders as... Uh, uh, the various uh, trade groups and just grassroots activists, if you will, the bloggers, etc., all uh, play very important roles in, in terms of communicating, um, you know, creating and communicating this distinctive identity, which eventually, hopefully, will emerge out of the Ontario, uh, for Ontario wine. Um, uh, just before I go any further, I also want to emphasize that um, if, if, any, if, uh, if anything I say is uh, uh, unclear, uh, do feel free to interrupt me. You, know, you do not need to wait until the end to ask uh, questions. Um, so, uh, so we can, all, you know, so I can always uh, clarify um, any points that uh, you may find uh, unclear. Um, so, so um, for, first thing that we want to uh, to touch upon rather briefly, uh, and that really relates to to, to, to this issue of, um, uh, you know, the fact that you know, premium and ultra premium wine is really about symbolism. Is uh, you know, there, there is ultimately um, the uh, the higher the price that wineries wish to charge, the higher um, uh, the artistic acclaim needs to be. So again, you know, wine is a cultural product, and uh, like any other cultural product, be it painting, art, sculpture, uh, etc., uh, you know, people uh, uh, people are you know buying not just what's in the bottle they're buying in store, but also very, of course, very much what's in the bottle as well, right? Um, so. With, with this slide, this is the, the, the point that we just wanted to make here, um, 
is, um, it, this is, this is the so-called strategy clock. And what we have done here is based on some of our findings, we have kind of transposed it into the world of wine. Um, so, uh, so whereas in, in conventional strategy research, generally speaking, you know, the, uh, you know, the higher, what am I doing here? The higher the, per the, the higher perceived value of the product that uh, you're selling, the more you are entitled to charge for it, right? So if, if, if your customers find the product to be valuable um, and it's serving some kind of a need for them, then, uh, then you are in fact entitled uh, to, to, to charge them more for it. Uh, however, you know, if your price is outpacing the perceived quality of the products or services that you're offering, then uh, those strategies are called, you know, strategies doomed for failure, right? So, uh, brought into the context of the wine industry, uh, we modified it not just value but artistic value, right? And so, artist and, and uh, so this is this is uh, just uh, you know this is one of the things that, that we want to mention to underscore the import the the earlier point that I made that um, it is a very much of a collective uh, process. So the uh, for example, wine writers, uh, grassroots activists, and uh, 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 restaurateurs uh, do play a very important role in determining, you know, what is precisely the artistic value of wine. You know, so basically, you know, is this really outstanding wine, right? So an outstanding wine is one, for example, that might be, you know, terroir driven. You know, you have uh, all this state of the art practices in the vineyard and the winery, etc. Right? So the higher the acclaim, the artistic acclaim of the wine, right, so theoretically then the, char the higher the price you're entitled to charge for it and, and, uh, um, and you do not want those things to be outpaced. Uh, uh, you do not want a price to be outpacing the, the acclaim. So what we have found, what we have found uh, is that in Ontario for the most part wineries are pursuing some uh, successfully, some no, so not so much so, strategies of differentiation and focus differentiation. I don't really know what this thing just, you know, happened in the middle of this. It was supposed to be a pretty, you know, I, I didn't really mean to cross out focus differentiation. Anyhow, um, um, so basically uh, some, some, something that we have heard over and over again uh, over the last few years in particular is that uh, given the kind of climate that we're dealing with, fairly challenging climate, and given um, uh, the uh, you know, the limited amount of land that we have to work with. So a lot of the things that, you, that I'm sure a lot of you uh, in the room and, uh, and online know better than I do um, is the fact that, you know, Ontario has to focus pretty much on premium and super premium wines, right? So therefore we have to pursue strategies of differentiation and uh, focus differentiation. So meaning, uh, you know, either, you know, so not, not really competing based on price, right? We cannot, we cannot really compete with, you know, the fu fusions of the world or whatever, right? So we can only compete based on, uh, you know, producing superior quality wines, right? So, therefore, so that's the, so differentiation, the strategy of differentiation is in wines that are really standing out, um, but are not, you know, particularly expensive, right? And then also you have wines that are, you know, really expensive and boldly so, uh, but they're really outstanding world-class wines, right? And so those are the two essentially, uh, you know, most viable strategies uh, uh, that, that, that uh, a number of people in the industry would agree uh, seem to be most viable. And uh, so what, um, of course, this underscores is, again, the importance of being able to convey this distinctive identity and symbolism and really being able to convey to the marketplace what's special, right? When you are charging, uh, you, know, you know, $25 for a bottle of wine, $30, $50, in some cases, $80, whatever, right? Um, you know, you have to be able to communicate to consumer what's so special about the wine, right? And it's not just trust me, right? <laughs> it has to be something more to that. So, so, uh, so then what's, so what's the deal with the identity? And uh, is it easy or complicated to create an identity? And, and, uh, and it is, we would argue it is very complicated actually because um, what determines an identity for an industry are a whole bunch of different factors, right? So for example, national culture, right? So for example, some countries are just naturally more patriotic, more uh, kind of in your face, if you will, more proud of whatever it is that they produce than other countries, right? Uh, and others are more modest and um, more cosmopolitan, etc. There's also regional culture history, right, which is kind of, you know, a smaller subset of the national culture. 
Um, there is, um, you know, of course, customers' past experiences, right, with, with, with the product. You know, have they had positive experiences? Have they had negative experiences with it? No experiences at all. Um, managerial practices. So how has the, uh, you know, what kind of things uh, have uh, wineries done in the past to, uh, you know, to build, uh, brand, you know, to brand themselves, to uh, organize themselves, etc. Production processes, right? The technical know-how uh, of, of, of the region uh, or of individual wineries. Industry dynamics, you know, are people getting along with each other in the industry? Are they, uh, are they competing uh, against each other? Is competition fierce, etc. Uh, and also industry history reputation. Does the industry have no history at all? It's kind of emerging and people, and kind of, re you know, all these things are closely related to each other, right? So maybe uh, the industry has had no bad history and so customers may not have had uh, bad experiences with industry products or industry might have had uh, bad history and customers still re remember the bad old days, right? So where I'm going to is, a, is the next slide here is just, which highlights the kind of you know specific issues that we have observed in this specific industry, which might be uh, exacerbating why we, as a, as a, as we will argue, are kind of lacking in a distinctive identity, right? So in general, Ontario in particular, and maybe to a lesser extent Canada, uh, in general, there is a bit of a lack of support local attitude, right? I mean, so of course that one one of the one of the things, uh, for example, that um, we oftentimes hear when people compare, say, the Ontario industry to the BC industry is that whereas in BC people are very much gung-ho about local wines, this is not quite the case uh, in Ontario, right? Um, there is a, really a lack of legitimate winemaking, indigenous uh, winemaking tradition, right? So whereas, you know, um, you know France, for example, is, uh, you know, very proud and, and, and uh, uh, of its winemaking tradition that has been established over hundreds of years, uh, whereas in Ontario we do have a history of winemaking that goes back to 1860s or so. Right? Most of that history is seen to be uh, illegitimate, right? Because it's tied to Concord grapes and uh, you know uh, baby ducks, etc. Right? Um, so uh, customers have had some rather negative experiences with Ontario wines. Again, kind of related to, to to the previous point, right? So there is still a generation of baby boomers and older who still remember the baby ducks and uh, you know uh, you know sort of fortified wines that are not quite fortified. Um, so uh, the, the industry has, and still, and that's that is something that, that, that we will touch on uh, further on, still continues to communicate somewhat of an unfocused message. So uh, what's special about Ontario wine? Um, you know, is somebody supposed to be drinking Chardonnay? Uh, is somebody supposed to be drinking Riesling? Or perhaps they're supposed to be looking for Nebbiolo or Shiraz, or, or is it Shiraz or Syrah, by the way, right? Because, because wineries are not even, can't even agree on that, right? Should, what should they call this uh, specific? Uh, grape varietal, etc. Right? Still, technical know-how still obviously improving tremendously, but still being refined. Um, uh, again, uh, lack, so also lack of focus and disagreement about the strongest varietal and styles. Um, reputation still somewhat connected to wines of the old, particularly for certain customer segments. Right? So again, so people who still remember those wines. And in some cases, for example, I recently spoke uh, to somebody who actually works for a winery um, and has been working uh, uh, in the industry for, for a couple of years. But prior to that individuals joining the winery, um, she uh, had not really, uh, she kind of stopped tasting uh, uh, and, and exploring um, uh, Ontario wines because you, know, she, because, you know, 10 or something years ago she tried them. They were not very good. You know, she wouldn't go back, right, until she uh, entered the industry. Yeah, all right. Um, so, and of course, uh, you know, so, uh, the, and of course the whole uh, VQA uh, versus seller in Canada confusion, which, you know, I'd rather not get into any length. <laughs> so, um, whoops, just, just to go back for a second. Yeah, so, so, so in sum, just, just before we got in trouble with some technical issues, right? So, so those are some of the reasons, right? This is not absolutely, this is, doesn't explain everything, right? But the, those are just sort of some examples of the, thing, of the issues that uh, we have uncovered and that have emerged you know, over, uh, over our three years of field work here um, that seem to be, that may be explaining uh, this lack of um, 
um, uh, identity you know, for Ontario wine. Right? So there is a little bit of hope, though, uh, that, that, that we can, uh, st that, that they, in fact, you know, we would argue that based on what is already happening in the industry, there is a, little, there is a few lessons um, in terms of what kind of identity might, in fact, be buried somewhere underground if we really look very closely for it. Right? So, so there, there are two, um, in general, there are two kind of rather crude and maybe somewhat um, caricature-like uh, traditions of winemaking in the world, right? So the kind of the old world tradition, right, which is kind of more associated with countries such as France, uh, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, versus new world, right, which is more associated with, uh, again, as the name implies, with the new world wine regions such as California, Australia, uh, Chile, etc. Right. So again, so uh, these are uh, these are really. Uh, I want to be very clear that that these are not necessarily like that. There's no region out there, you know, perfectly corresponds to any one of the traditions, especially these days, right? So, for example, Genesis, Genesis Robinson has pointed out that, you know, with globalization and lots of trade across different countries, you know, the winemaking traditions are getting kind of, you know, more intermingled and there is lots of learning, cross-border learning uh, amongst different wine regions. So, but in general, right, so, but we, uh, the old world tradition, right, is more associated with, you know, kind of cooler climates versus, you know, a new world tradition, more uh, hot climate, right? So, uh, the old world tradition, more, uh, more tradition bound versus the new world tradition, more fashion bound, right? Uh, limited number of varietals that are being cultivated and, and focused on versus, you know, anything goes. Um, uh, very imp the importance of collation is great to varietal being more important, right? Um, uh, and it, overall, in essence, then, uh, the old world tradition is kind of more terroir-based, if you will, right? Versus um, the new world tradition being more kind of science uh, excellence kind of based, right? So that essentially there is, there is an overarching belief in the old world tradition that, uh, well, we got the kind of climate we got, we got the kind of soil we got, um, you know, so, and all those conditions are pretty much out of our, out of our control and they will pretty much dictate what kind of wine we end up with, versus New World traditions much more uh, uh, rooted, in, rooted in the belief that, well, actually, uh, you know, there is lots that we can do as long as we keep on doing cutting edge research and as well, long as we find new ways to kind of beat the environment of submission, we're likely to be able to do things that uh, the environment would indicate that we shouldn't be doing, right? So, uh, and of course, and so all those things, so from geography to viticulture, uh, to uh, and, and winemaking to wine characteristic, right, lead to specific kind of wine profiles, right. So therefore, we find that uh, old world wine regions tend to produce wines that are more acid driven, uh, less fruity, more kind of demanding the right food pairings, etc. Uh, versus uh, new world wines that, that that tend to be more kind of approachable, more accessible, uh, easygoing, friendly, full bodied, etc. Right. So. Um, now, what, uh, what uh, we have found from, by studying wineries uh, in Ontario that seem to be uh, quite successful, you know, year after year, part, uh, and of course, how do we measure it? Well, you know, not all wineries are willing to share their, uh, not, not, willing, not necessarily willing to open their, you know, books to us. So we kind of have to measure their success somewhat more indirectly, such as uh, their reputation. Um, you know, do, do they get a lot of write-ups? Uh, do they win lots of awards? Uh, do they get um, a lot of um, um, positive reviews from restaurants and in the blogosphere, etc.? So the wineries that tend to be uh, more successful, um, as far as we can tell, are the ones, uh, by and large, that tend to kind of align themselves more closely with the old world tradition, right? And uh, essentially, if we really look closely, uh, and, you know, and again, a lot of people in this room and online know this better than I do, but of course our climate uh, doesn't look very much like California or Australia, right? Uh, even though it might be sunny outside right now. Um, uh, but, it, but, it, but, you know, but we, you know, we could be, uh, you know, more comparable to, to, to uh, you know, to Germany and, uh, you know, certain parts of France, etc., right? So, and that's, and that's really um, kind of uh, one of our key findings, right? And, and, and in essence, uh, if 
there is some kind of an identity that we are likely to be able to, uh, to find. Um, again, there, and there, we will, uh, we'll talk more about it later, um, you know, much more con conversation needs to happen. But what we can tell so far is if there is some kind of a nascent identity hiding underneath, you know, all this, uh, it might be that we might be sort of a, uh, you know, uh, old world, a wine region that happens to be located in the new world. Right, and so with, 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 on that note, I will hand, uh, hand this over to, to Dirk and uh, give us a few seconds, please, to uh, re-mic ourselves. Okay. So basically, yeah, uh, what I'm going to do is present uh, our results on an off, um, offspring project of, um, of this ongoing research is on the restaurants. Uh, so basically, this is a project that we started doing uh, last uh, summer, and it's ongoing. So we're basically now in the second phase of the data collection. And um, basically, what was kind of the reason behind our focus on Ontario restaurants, uh, there, there are a couple of them, is basically input insight that we got from our qualitative, uh, qualitative interviews with the different stakeholders. So first of all, a small wi wineries, as we know, have more difficult access to uh, LCBO. Uh, therefore, a restaurants by themselves can be a key uh, channel for them to get to the, to the market, to get in touch with consumers. At the same time, interestingly, if we talk to different wineries, there are actually very few wineries who have their own sales agent, just because they are too small. And some of them actually do have their own agent, the, the larger or med medium-sized wineries. Some of them also have an agent that would represent the dif uh, different wineries at the same time. Um, so that was kind of an important, uh, kind of important reason for us to say, okay, how do, um, what is the role of restaurants uh, in the industry? At the same time, um, if you talk to uh, kind of the higher profile wineries, we also see that uh, they often tell us that they are very proud if they are able to get uh, their wines on uh, at the wine list of a highly reputed restaurants. So being able uh, to get your foot into the door uh, and get your wine on the wine list of a rep reputable uh, restaurant by itself it can be a tool for a wineries to put their mark uh, in the market. And then last but not least, as Maxim already hinting at, uh, the very fact uh, that uh, Ontario wine uh, is often uh, not the first or even not the second choice of uh, local consumers, uh, the third or the fourth choice. We found it very interesting to see what the opinions are of the restaurants because these are one of the stakeholders that have first-hand exposures uh, to consumers. Uh, they are the ones that perhaps they want to convince a consumers if they have different wines, European wines, Californian wines, Ontario wines on the wine list, eh, to choose for uh, Ontario wines. Okay, so basically this is kind of an overview uh, of, this, uh, of this little project we're doing. So the kind of, it, one of the main purposes is to better explain uh, why some restaurants are more or less likely to support VQA wine and if kind of focus on the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, in order to do that, we, we chose for a quantitative approach uh, through a survey instrument. Um, as we all know, uh, some of us who have done survey research is often very challenging uh, to get people to fill out surveys, and we also uh, encountered those challenges. But basically, we, we, we decided to do a large-scale study, uh, so we uh, sent surveys to uh, almost 2,000 restaurants uh, across the province, small uh, restaurants to larger restaurants, basically a random, a, a random sample. And uh, basically, the uh, one way that we uh, try to convince uh, restaurants in their busy schedule to participate is that we promise them uh, customized feedback. And actually, we have finished that first round. So every uh, restaurant that participated, were over 250, received a um, customized summary. So they got an insight not only in the overall findings, but also were able to position them, themselves at their scores uh, across uh, with uh, the other participants. And we feel that this probably helped to convince people to, um, uh, to participate. Um, uh, sometimes a project like this have kind of uh, funny uh, outcomes or side effects. I remember some, uh, uh, actually some restaurants sending us a takeout menu together with a completed survey, even if they were <laughs> located in Ottawa or in faraway places, right? Or I'm actually now on the mailing list of another restaurant to know about their weekly uh, specials. Okay, so this is... Uh, interesting site information. Kind of another kind of uh, maybe anecdote. Uh, this is probably not, uh, we probably all know that is some stakeholders in the, in the industries uh, have very extreme views towards LCBO. Uh, there's probably a minority, but there are some. 
And actually, uh, one of other, the other ways that we tried to uh, gouge participation was that all uh, restaurants that participated, they were promised a $10 LCBO uh, certificate. And we actually kept our promises and, of course, sent them uh, those certificates. There were actually one or two restaurants who are very uh, basically saying that we are not participating in this uh, survey because I have never set one foot into LCBO, so I don't want to be affiliated at all uh, with, uh, with this survey. This is just an, uh, an anecdote. Okay, so let me move on. So this is kind of an overview of our, I would say, our framework the, and also our results. So in order to explain a restaurant support for VKA wine, we basically have a four categories of driving factors. Okay, so the first, uh, the first factor has to do with uh, the overall rationale, uh, what we call logic, in restaurants' decision making and which wines to include in their wine list. It is the artistic, which uh, Maxim alluded to already, versus commercial logic. Second one, the extent to which they have a preference uh, for or tend to prefer the old world um, wine tradition versus the new world wine tradition. Third, their perceptions about the wider environment, the institutional environment, not only their perception of support for VKA wine, but also the perception of how competitive is the market in which they operate. Um, and the extent to which they try to build relationships with all the stakeholders in the industry. And then last, last but not least, we had a whole uh, list of uh, personal characteristics, um, interests, and we wanted to see, uh, get better insight at how those uh, personal interests affect, increase or decrease support for VKA wine. So basically what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is uh, go, go over those three categories and show you the results. And I will actually combine uh, the first uh, two uh, categories into into one. Uh, so the first uh, two categories uh, pertain to uh, the overall guiding principles. Um, so first of all, uh, what do we mean uh, to, to re reiterate a little bit uh, what uh, what you already have heard before? Uh, the artistic versus commercial logic. Uh, so what is a commercial uh, logic? Basically, it means that the main kind of uh, criteria that are used in decision making in the industry is to have wines that sell. Okay. In the context of restaurants, it would mean that uh, the sommelier or the, uh, whoever is responsible for the wine list, it would, um, to an important extent, be driven uh, by including wines that they think is, are really easy to sell, right, that are good for their uh, commercial uh, success. On the other hand, uh, artistic reputation uh, pertains to uh, an interest that is basically uh, driven by having critical acclaim, having um, a certain reputation by including certain wines on the wine list. Okay, so for instance, one of the questions uh, that we asked in the survey is to what extent uh, do you feel that uh, including wines is kind of a piece of art uh, that has an important artistic component of how you compose or update and change your uh, your wine list. So basically, what is the kind of the crude finding? Uh, we find that the extent to which restaurants support Vico A wine is positively related uh, to their um, artistic. Uh, the importance of artistic uh, interest, rationale, whereas it is negative uh, related to the commercial logic. Okay, so perhaps this is not very surprising, but first of all, I think the fact that we find a negative relationship between uh, the commercial logic and the VQA support uh, actually kind of shows uh, we believe that uh, often uh, selling VQA wine is perceived as something being very challenged and maybe a difficult route uh, towards easy uh, commercial success that perhaps uh, including those wines in your wine list is more kind of a strategy that, uh, that, that may help long-term success, but not short-term success. It, whereas uh, if um, artistic reputation is very really important to you, then you might be willing uh, to sacrifice that short-term uh, profit and kind of building uh, a long-term reputation in the market that you're actually someone uh, that's supporting and including those local wines on your wine list. And secondly, uh, we find in terms of the two traditions, new world versus old world, uh, that there is no relationship uh, between people's preferences for new world and the support of VKA wine, whereas there is a positive uh, relationship between uh, supporting uh, old world wine tradition and VQA support. Okay, so based on these results and uh, together with the insights that we received from our interviews, we basically would conclude here um, uh, that uh, to be an effective proponent of VKA wine, it might be important uh, for restaurants uh, to basically sell and uh, position uh, the wines, the VKA wines on their wine list as being a more uh, typical old world wine uh, rather than new world. 
And I remember one anecdote of a, of a restaurateur that we interviewed who basically told us that kind of a key issue might, hear, might hear be the management of expectations, right? That if basically the consumers are represented with the wrong expectations about what Ontario wine is all about, it might be actually make it more difficult, more challenging for a local restaurant to sell VKA wine. It's for instance, one anecdote eh, I remember was eh, a restaurant telling us in eh, 2007, a great year, eh, uh, good weather, good wine, basically eh, allowed the reason to produce some wines that were somehow eh, similar to the Californian wine. However, right, if restaurants emphasize that too much, maybe uh, consumers might have the wrong expectation that uh, the region will be consistently able to uh, offer that type of wine across years, okay? So kind of an important conclusion that we make here so far is uh, make sure that you use the correct uh, reference, a point of reference. Okay, so this is uh, in terms of uh, the, um, the perceptions of the local, uh, the traditions and guiding principles. Also, if you have any questions during my talk, please uh, interrupt me and ask away. Sure. Yeah. Afterwards? Sure. Um, what's the industry doing to make Ontario's wine have a clear identity in Canada and internationally? And the second part of the question is: Are wineries, restaurants, and LCBO working together? Okay. So that's yeah, basically an overarching question. I think that covers our whole uh, presentation. So I think, yeah, what are different stakeholders doing to create uh, an identity? They will probably leave that also at the end of the presentation, but yeah, we're happy to, to talk about that a little bit. Um, yes, I think there are different, I think uh, we have talked to the Wine Council of Ontario, for instance, uh, one of the also st key stakeholders in the area, and they are very aware, right, of this issue of identity. So um, uh, we, they, they are basically trying also to, to be, uh, that's our feeling, to be as inclusive as possible. Right, in terms of um, creating that, uh, that identity and have different uh, stakeholders uh, work together. I think if we talk to different wineries, um, I know if you look at the media, we often uh, see the wine industry as being very confrontational, but uh, what I remember from the interviews that we have done with uh, different stakeholders, uh, people in LCBO and in wineries, people basically say yeah, in order for the region to move forward, it's very important to collaborate, and I think that collaboration does happen uh, to a great extent already, rather than to compete. Right? Because in a sense, uh, the, the different, it's good to have some uh, uh, diversification differences across different players uh, in the industry. At the same time, right, if there's too much confrontation, that might actually um, look negatively uh, upon the whole region. Okay. Thank you for the online question. Okay, so then in terms of our uh, second big category, uh, the perceptions about the wider uh, environment, industry and competitive environment of restaurants. So kind of the first point is that um, we find uh, that there are positive, it has a positive relationship or that if you can support is positively related to favorable perceptions about a three specific components of the broader institutional environment. Uh, the first one maybe, it, the, the one that would come first to mind is regulatory support in the perceptions about the extent to which government is supports VKA wine. However, there are two important uh, additional uh, dimensions that came out. Uh, the first one is what we call the cognitive environment. It's basically a restaurant's perception that they feel that overall there is a knowledge uh, among consumers uh, about what Ontario wine is uh, all about. That, for instance, they would know uh, what the difference is between VQA wine and CIC, a seller in Canada. So basically, we find that uh, the more restaurateurs uh, are um, convinced that there is some general knowledge uh, about those differences and about those key issues, the more likely they might uh, support VQA wine. And then, third, uh, maybe that's the most uh, interesting one the normative support. Uh, this basically captures the extent to which restaurants think that. Uh, uh, talking about uh, VQA wine, drinking uh, inter, uh, Ontario wine is something that's uh, overall acceptable, socially acceptable, right? It kind of uh, captures a, a positive buzz, a positive spin around VQA wine. So the more that restaurants are convinced, right, that VQA wine is not something that one should be ashamed uh, of, uh, to say it in an extreme way, uh, the more likely they will support uh, that type of wine. Second bullet point, uh, we also captured a restaurant's perception of the perceived turmoil of the industry. What do we mean there? The extent to which they believe it, that often customer preferences has changed over time, that they often want uh, to have something new. Okay, well, so what do we find here? A, a positive relationship between that perception and VQA support. Okay, what is, how we, can we interpret that? Well, one possible interpretation would be it, that including VQA wine in, the, in your wine list is actually a tool 
right, that can help you uh, to um, meet a certain uh, changing uh, preferences of consumers in the marketplace. And then last but not least, we also find that if your A support is higher, if restaurateurs to a higher extent they try to build strong relationships with key stakeholders in the industry, and some of those stakeholders they were wineries themselves, but also wine critics and wine writers. And basically, I think one kind of implication from this is that if from the winery's perspective, if they want to kind of um, help uh, restaurants uh, to help them to sell VKA wine, one recommendation would be to involve as much as possible uh, those restaurants or even waiting staff uh, in, uh, in the winery, for instance, by inviting uh, the restaurant's personnel uh, to, the, to the winery and basically convince them and give them more uh, clarification about uh, how the wine is made maybe the, the story, the family story of the winery, and there are actually some wineries who do that, who told us that that is something very important for them to kind of manage uh, that relationship with the restaurants very closely, but not all of them do that. Okay, and then the last block uh, of factors that we look at eh, are really personal, eh, kind of personal characteristics of the restaurant. So basically we find here, eh, if you look at the underlined uh, terms here, eh, all those uh, characteristics eh, were positively related to VKA support except for a people's level of conservatism. So first of all, if restaurants perceive that they have uh, the knowledge themselves personally or their staff about VKA wine, more likely and not surprisingly to support that type of wine. If for instance we do, we do also find that uh, restaurants who have a sommelier with an official sommelier certificate they are more likely to be supporters. Secondly, as we kind of, uh, maybe not so surprisingly, but it's kind of an interesting finding that there's kind of a, um, a fuzzy border here between uh, restaurants, uh, personal, professional decisions, and their personal life, their personal preferences. So we do find uh, that restaurants who like to drink wine in general or to visit wineries uh, in their free time are more likely to support VKA wine. Um, I also remember actually a respondent who put a smiley face on the survey and telling us that he, unfortunately, he does not have any free time at all. So he wished that he could drink uh, VKA wines and visit wineries, but the wineries are a very, uh, restaurants are very busy and said, well, sorry, but I just don't have the time for that. Okay, third, uh, we also find that restaurants' innovative attitude, personal innovative attitude, the extent to which they personally try to, uh, to try new things, also including wine, makes them more likely to support VKA wine. Uh, that kind of uh, corresponds with our finding about uh, the positive perceptions with the changing competitive environment. Fourth, and maybe that's an interesting one also in terms of the identity uh, debate and the identity issue, we had a couple of questions that assessed restaurants um, of the extent to which they uh, value sustainability related issues in their uh, business related decisions. If for instance, to what extent is it important if for you to source uh, local ingredients, uh, not only on your wine list, uh, but also uh, on your food items? Or to what extent uh, do you think it's an important part of your mission of your restaurant uh, to decrease uh, your ecological footprint uh, of what you're doing? And we did find uh, that uh, proponents of VQA are actually the restaurants that are more likely uh, to care for sustainability-related issues. Second last characteristic, patriotism. Uh, that's also a, a, an interesting one in light of uh, the findings from our interviews that uh, we believe or we, we hear people say that uh, in general, Canadian consumers, consumers here are not very patriotic as it comes to the decision to, um, to buy wine. Somehow counterintuitive. Uh, what do we find here? That there is a very strong uh, relationship uh, between restaurants' level of patriotism and um, their VQA support. We also, if you look at the patriotism measure uh, results, uh, the, the, the values were very high. Uh, so maybe there's some kind of bias here in how people uh, fill out surveys, but we found that in most restaurants, uh, restaurateurs see themselves as being very patriotic. So kind of the spin we would give this is that if indeed patriotism might be very important for restaurateurs in terms of how they look at VKA wine, uh, that type of uh, attitude can actually, used, can actually be used uh, by the industry, kind of using that support, that emotional capital uh, of uh, patriotic restaurateurs uh, to help uh, sell, to help uh, uh, support um, Vika A wine. And then last, eh, maybe but not least, eh, is the conservatism. So kind of, it was more kind of out of uh, academic curiosity. Um, and I think uh, to the credit here of Maxim, he said, well, we really, he, uh, we really should include this type of uh, questions here uh, in terms of 
kind of uh, assessing to what extent a people's level of conservatism matters in terms of um, people willing or not willing to support local wine because yeah, maybe our intuition would say that people who are more conservative in general, we're not here talking about a conservative in terms of wine, but in general about how they see the role of government, uh, business, uh, authority, and so on, yeah, that more conservative people would maybe be more uh, likely to support local wine. However, if from our interviews we kind of got the other, uh, all the other way around, that is actually people who are more progressive, tends to be more the supporters of EKA wine. And that's actually what we found. Yeah, we found a negative relationship yeah, between the level of a conservatism and um, people's support of uh, Vico A wine. Yes, there's a question in the audience. Yeah, if I mean anything else negative, uh, besides that, I can give you an example. I've been in restaurants before, especially in Toronto, and steered away from Ontario wines to whatever they call custom. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, in a sense, all the positive relationships can also be interpreted as being a negative ones, right? If you flip around, right? If you flip around a, the, um, the meaning uh, of the words. But I think y your point, what you're saying, is very well taken. Yeah, we actually, it's also my personal experience and maybe of, of many of us, right? If you visit the restaurants, you basically have to do the effort yourself as a consumer, right? To guide the attention of the, of the waiter. Uh, but I just wonder if anything else you yeah. want to serve it, though, like the new restaurants, say anything else negative. Well, negative about wine or negative, um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, um, I think all, overall, right, uh, well, uh, some people, yeah, just, I think, I remember actually some people who, they also, we also call them back, right, some actually a restaurant refused to fill out the survey because they basically plainly told me when I called them yeah, that they don't believe in VKA wine, right, and that we chatted a little bit and they basically said, well, it's just uh, typically the VKA wines are too expensive. They compare to the quality, and therefore it's so challenging for me eh, to, to, to sell them that I don't want to go through the effort any, to that anymore. I've tried it, but I gave up. I remember that, someone telling us that. You yes? Said you, you, you uh, said that a few thousand uh, places or restaurants, and you got 250 came back as your, as your sample. Yeah. What's the cross section of the uh, sample? Is it uh, higher end restaurants, or is it the whole spectrum? Of the it's actually the whole spectrum, yeah. So we did, yeah. It's basically, we, we did have the, yeah, there was uh, uh, restaurants that are very small to very high. There are actually also restaurants that are part of hotels or part of change. Mm -hmm. So we did have... Uh, Do you see any in, in that, in, in the sample there? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's a good Are question. Yeah. yeah, I think we, uh, not on the top of my head, right, but I think the, like, for instance, the, the restaurants that do have a sommelier, right, who, who tends to be the, I think, the smaller, uh, the smaller restaurants or the ones that, that really uh, put lots of emphasis on, uh, on local wine are the ones that are also more supportive. And, of course, it's kind of probably a kind of a reinforcing circle, yeah. right, so that, um, and maybe, I mean, there's lots of things we can still do here. I think one thing we would like to do is uh, how successful, right, our restaurant in selling uh, Vico A wine, and maybe how can that spur right, their enthusiasm or maybe uh, decrease it right, if they find that the challenges are just too high for them or perhaps they might not have uh, the expertise. Yes? Yeah, you're correct. And actually, it's often something I ask my students when I teach here in, in, in faculty of business. And uh, yeah, many of them have no idea what it means, right? They kind of say it's a quality well, label. Yeah, and I think, well, that's, yeah, that definitely uh, uh, speaks to, uh, the, to the identity formation. I think if, and I think what you're saying is basically supported by, by the results we find here, right? We do see variation, right, in terms of people's knowledge, perceived knowledge, right? And the f so kind of interesting is that it's not only the restaurant's own knowledge that might drive them uh, to be supporters, but also how they perceive uh, the broader environment to be knowledgeable. And maybe they, have, they might have the knowledge themselves, uh, but they might perceive that uh, there is not... Uh, the consumers themselves right, do not have sufficient knowledge and therefore 
they would not do the effort. Yeah, so the issue of a collective effort, right, yeah. basically. So the different well, stakeholders. Yeah, so the, the, yeah, those, basically the hook here is to kind of explain if you get support. However, it, those, it, if you look at the different values by themselves, I cannot say it all the top of my head, but they're also correlated, right? So for instance, restaurants uh, that tend to uh, emphasize is sustainability. In my, uh, my guess would be that those, those are the ones, right, that, that um, maybe uh, score lower on conservatism. I'm just guessing here, right? So I'm sure uh, this is basically a fruit for further analysis. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Did you have any questions on the survey about organical biotech and the reception of Yeah, not in particular, not in particular that, that question, but uh, yeah, basically the questions about sustainability okay. uh, would, would cover those, but yeah, we didn't go that specific. Uh, was it from across the province? Obviously, there were so many from Toronto, right? But we did get a nice geographic spread because it was basically a snowballing technique that we used. So we also had some people from Ottawa who gave us addresses of restaurants there. So um, yeah, the Niagara region was definitely they were represented because of some contacts we got here from the local wine council. So there were actually some restaurants included that we knew personally. So but basically, it was a nice spread. So we didn't want to focus only on Toronto or the Niagara region, yeah. but basically have a nice. I'm curious to see how, how Niagara would respond. Yeah, it's something we will, it will sure, yeah, look into more. <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> sure, yes. From your research, have you discovered that the interior industry actually has an identity? Or don't we at the moment have an identity? So the question is, yeah, if we have found for our, from our survey or from our project overall, if there is an identity or if there is an identity crisis, yeah, my answer would be, my personal view would, yeah, it depends who you talk to, right? Some people maybe try to, to mention that there is an identity crisis that would focus on, uh, on, on, the, on the troubles or the issues, for instance, about the labeling, the VQA versus CIC. And uh, I, I kind of, if I can speak to the, for the two of us, I basically kind of, uh, we would basically say yeah, these are very important issues and they need to be addressed, right? And different parties that might have opposing interests have to work together. However, even if those issues are solved, right, this is not enough, right? So basically at the end of the day, you want to have people buy uh, the wine. So there should be something more than just that uh, the regulations are, uh, are in order. Um, so there should be something more, okay? Yeah. For five years, totaling $16 million. But it's restricted simply to VQA. It's almost as if we don't have any other wines in the province but the VQA. And, and yet, um, VQA sales in total today are something like 20% of pure Ontario wine. Um, government seems to be really anxious that we buy VQA wines. 
support that. But unfortunately, we, we made a deal to do that. We're producing milk, but we also produce some pretty good other wines. Yeah. Yeah, fruit wines, for instance. Wines. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I don't think government has made any attempt to have our larger wineries start producing more 100% Ontario wine and less blended wines. And, and that's why I think our, our industry is spinning its wheels. We're never going to get an identity established when we, we just go all full together. Yeah, so okay, the question was about identity. Uh, maybe in the, in the, in, for the sake of time, um, uh, but let me be very short maybe because we're going to touch upon that in the, in the last part of the presentation as well. Um, I think in terms of the identity and the different views that there are, it's often also a perception of being clear, right? So uh, if you talk to he heavily proponents, right, of VQA wine, they would not necessarily say that they think that blended wines do not have a place, right, in the industry. However, there should be clarity. Eh? Their concern is often eh? there should be clarity in how eh, that type of wine and how the label is perceived and formulated, such that consumers eh, are not uh, put on the wrong foot. Right? It is kind of clear that eh, some wines indeed are completely uh, use 100% eh, local grapes, whereas others are are, are the blends. Okay. So I think clarity of communication uh, is important because probably the interest, right, of the different stakeholders some of the really big wineries versus small wineries are just by definition, they can never completely match each other, right? So there are different interests. So it's kind of a matter of organizing the industry such that uh, those different interests do not uh, harm, uh, harm the overall uh, perception that consumers or other stakeholders uh, might have uh, about those players. Okay, so maybe... I was, I was yeah. Say, yeah. It sounds like from what you're... Uh, Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, that, that's, that's, we cannot make that the conclusion from our survey, and I think from our, in, from our interviews, uh, I think we've, we sometimes think that there's a wrong, actually a wrong perception about many in the industry, that they believe that it's kind of an automatic process, but actually I wouldn't say that this is a finding uh, that is going to be easy or that it is easy, so there should be more, right, than just uh, solving those issues, but yeah, there, should, there should basically should be a coordinated effort, um, and yeah, collectively by, by the different actors in the field. Okay, so very quickly in terms of implications from the, from the uh, uh, restaurant survey. Uh, so first of all, if for restaurants that do uh, support AVKA wine, uh, that seems to be a potential tool for them uh, kind of to stand out okay, in, in a competitive marketplace. Secondly, uh, to be an effective uh, promoter of VKA wine uh, using that right referent, it might be important old world wine versus uh, new world wine. And then knowledge seems to be, be important, right? Being knowledgeable eh, about uh, VKA wine might be important eh, to kind of drive eh, people's enthusiasm to, to, uh, to sell that wine, at least from the restaurant's perspective. That actually may also include eh, to training eh, the waiting staff, right? Not only having a sommelier might not be enough, but also training your staff and being knowledgeable, knowing about the wineries eh, that are on the wine list. And then eh, maybe not, last but not, not least, if the survey also included the possibility for people to, to kind of give their own opinion in narrative form. Uh, one thing that uh, came out there was uh, if we asked uh, what, what do you think, what do you associate with a wine with most, people would often say kind of a, it's a source of pride, right? It's something that's a very local product uh, and we believe uh, that uh, we as a restaurant it should be proud of them. Obviously not all restaurants tell us that, right? Is, is the ones maybe that are most, uh, have been most successful or have the degree or have the knowledge, right? But this is, is something that came out. Okay, if there, if there are no more questions about this specific, uh, about the survey, then either I will hand it to Maxim or if there's a question. Sure. From online. Um, yeah. Did any of the restaurant employees indicate a lack of salespeople from Ontario? Lack of education for licensees? Um, well, 
yeah, so, so basically, uh, I think indirectly, uh, nobody, I cannot remember that anyone would directly uh, um, complain about that, but I think from the interviews, right, uh, from the interviews uh, from restaurants, they would actually say that there's some wineries, they might basically have never had any representative of those wineries uh, visiting them, right? So that they basically would say, yeah, we were actually willing maybe to have some more, to know more about the wines, but uh, the, the industry or the winery should be more proactive, right? So there is some feeling among some restaurants, right? Difficult to generalize that uh, wineries should be more proactive and try to... Uh, I don't know, yeah, if the, <laughs> yeah, uh, three, sure, yeah, so actually someone asks uh, if the problem is that they would see not enough wineries that are representing Vigo A or if it's the other way around, that there are actually two that are overloaded uh, by representatives and I don't have direct uh, yeah, insight in that, in that particular, my gut feeling would, would be that uh, the restaurants are actually saying that they do not know too much or not enough, that they don't know enough uh, about local wineries. Okay, then we'll, I guess we'll do the another switch. Yeah. Enough, I suppose. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, so with with respect to uh, to that question, if if they hear if, if they don't hear enough from uh, um, VQA wineries, or if they hear too much, uh, the the the, uh, the interviewees that have meant that have commented on the issue for us have mentioned that. For the most part, if they do hear from uh, VQA wineries, it is from large wineries, and uh, the small wineries they almost don't hear from at all. So I think it kind of weighs in more on the side of you know not not hearing enough. So um, just uh, just a couple of, so just a couple of um, I think whoopsie. Um, so a couple of concluding um, uh, uh, summation type uh, uh, remarks here. Um, so, um, in general, what, what all of these different trends of research that we have conducted so far uh, seem to be indicating is that um, wineries are competing not only for market share but also uh, for artistic acclaim, which is uh, really essential for the you know for the sales of premium and uh, super premium wine, uh, and, um, um, uh, and and I think that that is that is something that a number of wineries understand it well, and other wineries uh, 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 you know have yet to uh, appreciate that. Um, so, uh, therefore, uh, they need to. Therefore, wineries need to um, uh, ensure uh, continued compliance with the, you know, with what we have called here artistic rationality. Really demonstrating that they are in fact producers of, of uh, fine, you know, terroir, you know, driven, you know, uh, world class wine. Um, so how how are and and uh, and this is very much of a, again it's a very much collective effort. So it's not just wineries are, are shouldn't be. Uh, uh, expected it by themselves, and they shouldn't really be trying to do it all by themselves, because there are a number of um, other players in the industry that can be very helpful uh, in this task. So, uh, for example, wine writers and bloggers uh, even can can be very uh, can be very helpful in this task. So, uh, working with such individuals might be is, is a very important thing. Again, some wineries are doing spectac spectacular job uh, of this, and other wineries. Uh, do not quite appreciate the importance of the individuals. So, for example, um, sending wine uh, to select wine writers or bloggers or inviting writers and bloggers to the winery. Now, again, um, a lot of wineries are doing that already, but uh, 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 we've been told by, uh, by um, uh, different wine writers that actually a lot of wineries, you know, they, they never hear uh, from, from a lot of these wineries. Uh, in fact, what, tends to, what ends up oftentimes happening is that wineries end up bombarding the kind of the superstar uh, uh, wine writers, you know, the, the, the people who are writing for Globe and Mail, for Toronto Star, etc., and they're forgetting about all the, all the other players who are perhaps do not have that kind of elite status, but they're, but they're also, they're very, uh, you know, they're really um, advocating on behalf of the industry and they're really proponents and uh, so, uh, and they, they really, and the, some of these, for example, some of these bloggers really do appreciate uh, you know, being you know uh, uh, re reached out to by wineries, and they you know makes them more enthusiastic and makes them more committed to working on behalf of the industry. Um, uh, educating restaurateurs about wineries approach is very important. Uh, again, uh, and not just the high-profile ones, but you know I think some of the some of the survey findings that uh, Dirk presented I think 
help us to identify some of the restaurants that might be most um, amenable to this. So for example, restaurants that are really uh, committed to sustainability type issues uh, tend to be more receptive, right? Uh, uh, restaurants that, uh, you know, uh, that, that are, uh, 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 you know, that, like, that uh, you know, kind of trying, that are uh, more in more dynamic and competitive environment where they really kind of feel like they need to keep on changing things up uh, and trying to entertain their consumers with new offerings all the time. All, again, maybe more amenable to this kind of approaches, et cetera. Uh, putting one's best forward, uh, one, one best face forward, or one best food forward, I'm not really sure what, you know, what should have gone on that slide, um, is that, um, uh, you know, often, oftentimes, you know, wineries uh, have to know what to show to the consumers and other stakeholders and what not to show. So, for example, um, larger wineries sometimes recognize that it's a good idea for them to avoid, you know, to try trying to avoid looking too industrial, um, you know, by like not showing them too much of their production facilities, etc. Because you know, people like, you know, oftentimes people, uh, you know, like to have this romantic notions attached to wines and that uh, they don't they do not necessarily want to see these you know huge production facilities that may be off putting to them right so so therefore so oftentimes we find that larger wineries try to you know even even medium sized wineries try to avoid showing too much um, whereas, uh, for example, s very small boutique wineries, in fact, they know that actually that, that's, that's a selling point for them. So sometimes they will take people into their production facilities and barrel, uh, barrel sales and say, look at our, at our press. It's the tiniest press you'll ever see anyway, right? So that's the kind of thing that helps to kind of uh, underscore to, to, to the uh, consumers and to the writers that see we're really hands-on, we're small scale, and kind of, you know, really trying to communicate that uh, nice mystique, etc. So uh, a number of people have asked uh, questions about this identity uh, issue and are we making progress, are we not making progress? Um, our sense is, yes, some progress being made, uh, but there is much more work to be done. Um, if we look around the world, um, uh, in every successful wine industry uh, uh, appears to have some kind of personality attached to it, right? So when we think of France, we're thinking sophistication, perhaps a little snobbism, but whatever, right? That, that, that no, no big deal. Australia, fun, uh, adventurous, entertaining, etc. Um, so we, we, we still do not have that uh, kind of personality, right? So uh, what we end up, uh, we, you know, when we ask wineries, uh, when we ask uh, even, you know, advocates of wine, in, of the local wine industry to uh, convey what's the personality of Ontario wine, in the end, uh, they, uh, they tend to eventually default to either objective features such as, oh, well, you know, it's high in acidity, for example, um, or Perhaps uh, you know they might define some uh, characteristic varietals, um, but uh, then they start uh, kind of you know using terms like it's similar to this, similar to that, right? Oh, this this wine is Burgundian in style, perhaps this wine is uh, uh, Moselle-like in style, etc. Uh, so we, so yes, we're able to do the story we're as good as X, right? But of course, the, when the consumer is choosing amongst all these wines that are available to them, they need to hear not just that they we are as good as X, we also need to know, well, why shouldn't they just go out and buy X, right? If you are as good as Burgundy, why shouldn't they just go buy Burgundy, right? If you're as good as, as Moselle, why not just Moselle, right? So, so and that's something that we really need to uh, have industry-wide conversation about, you know, what, what is the personality uh, that goes above and beyond what's, what's, what's in the bottle. Um, important to focus on the varietals that, that uh, do well uh, year after year. Uh, so, uh, and, again, and again, and this is, and this is sort of like a, we, can, we can also look at it from a simple economic point of view. Um, you know, any, all wineries, all, all businesses need to try to exercise as much uh, economies of scale as they possibly can, uh, even uh, if we are dealing with a small region, small vineyards, etc. The point is that if you're a winery that's producing 5,000 cases and you're attempting to make 15 different wines, there is really very little opportunity for economies of scale of any kind, right? So, so it is a good idea to perhaps uh, focus on, uh, you know, on fewer uh, varietals, uh, make fewer wines, and to try to make more of, of such wines. Um, so, uh, and we're not saying you shouldn't experiment, right? It, it is fine to, but, but of course, it's, it's perhaps, uh, uh, you know, not a great idea to plant, you know, 
you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, like if you're a winery uh, with, uh, you know, that's got uh, 10,000 uh, acres of vineyard, perhaps not a good idea to plant, uh, you know, uh, I'm exaggerating, of course, uh, 8,000 of them to Cabernet Sauvignon, right? Just, you know, just an idea. Um, so, uh, and the, the other thing is that also, again, uh, the, the point that, that, uh, that Dirk already mentioned is that the competition is not really just with uh, the mess. In fact, it's really not uh, domestic competition. The competition is very much international, right? Even, even if you're not exporting, um, you know, LCBO brings in wines from all over the world, and the uh, Ontario market is one of the most competitive markets in the world. So, um, so uh, on the one hand, we might be tempted to say, oh, well, you know, if somebody wants to make, you know, a very poor exemplar, uh, you know, of, of so-and-so wine that, you know, it won't be hurting anybody because they're just hurting themselves, they won't be selling it. Well, actually, it does hurt the industry because uh, poor, poor, poor exemplars get generalized and uh, are uh, taken as evidence why, you know, uh, you know, why Ontario wine is no good, which is precisely why people still remember baby ducks and things like that, right? Um, Managing expectations, uh, uh, again, that's something Dirk mentioned before, but I guess a, a really great quote from one of the restaurateurs that we interviewed uh, some time ago, he said, well, it's hell of a lot of uh, more difficult to sell um, Ontario wine to somebody who's expecting California, right? So, again, we're not necessarily saying that you should be explicitly comparing wines to, you know, to Burgundy or whatever else, but, but when, you are st when you're characterizing wines in terms that are, consi or that are inconsistent, with uh, the typical profile of Ontario wine, then uh, you're potentially setting up consumers for disappointment, and, and again, it hurts the individual winery. It also hurts uh, other wineries as well. So, um, international critical attention uh, is important. So, wine in the, uh, wineries have been chasing uh, critics, uh, perhaps mistakenly chasing, you know, the wine spectators of the world that are not necessarily interested. Uh, in, uh, in the kind of style of wine that we're able to produce, right? So, so perhaps European critics might be a better target. Um, exporting, now, I know this, every time this issue gets mentioned, it becomes a very controversial issue because people say, oh, we should first, uh, I, I, was, I was at the Canadian Wine Summit at, at, at BC um, last week, uh, and uh, so every time the issue comes up, people say, well, uh, you know, we, we should first own the domestic market before we think about exporting. The problem is kind of going back to the to the issue that we have mentioned before, that sometimes that uh, 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 that Canadians sometimes are not as uh, you know kind of gung ho about their own domestic products. In fact, uh, I might take it a step further by saying that we don't tend to be very interested in our domestic products until they have succeeded internationally. Um, so, uh, so exporting, uh, e you know, even in small numbers to to, to select markets, uh, just for the purpose of gaining uh, critical acclaim here and getting write-ups and just. Uh, making people here at home see those headlines of our wines, you know, succeeding in certain markets, etc., uh, can be enormously helpful. Again, even if it's a tiny percentage of our production, it does tend to be, uh, it, you know, it, those, it does tend to um, uh, 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 really help the industry, right? Again, case in point being, the reason that ice wine, uh, that Canadians are actually proud of ice wine, even though most Canadians do not drink ice wine, right? So it's, it's a product that, 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 it, that, you know, it's not really selling very well domestically, right? And everybody who's bought it already, you know, bought it and they, you know, re-gift it. Um, but, but people are very proud of it, right? And the reason they're very proud of it is because it's, it's been, a, it's been a, such an uh, international success story. It has demonstrated to the, to, the, to the people that, yeah, we can make something that will be acclaimed internationally and therefore, um, uh, you know, and therefore, we sh it, you know, it must be good for us. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, well, uh, you, uh, well, it's. Uh, I, I guess. Um, I, I, I think that that's the question. If you uh, probably, if you were to ask a lot of wineries, they probably might disagree with you, right? That they don't. I mean, they don't want to be known just for that. Right? Well, I, I yes. Agree. You don't want to be known just for that. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and any case, so, so just to conclude, a couple of things. So uh, where we're moving, so this is ongoing study, right? We're we're going to continue with with uh, with a lot of these questions, and we're going to, um, you know, uh, explore this 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 these questions as uh, um, as uh, uh, we continue on. So how can we, um, you know, how can we be as good as other regions yet try to carve out our our own uh, niche? 
Um, how can uh, the various industry insiders communicate more effectively? Um, the different roles of the different stakeholders within the industry. Um, how can, uh, you know, so sustainability is growing bigger and bigger. Uh, the uh, wine industry hasn't quite yet tapped into the potential of it. How can we do that better? Uh, and can we have synergies with other uh, industries? And how, and how, of course, can consumers' patriotism be activated? So I'll stop talking and just take some questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the the, 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 so the the question is, uh, uh, can our conclusions uh, about restaurants uh, be applied uh, to uh, other stakeholders? Uh, that that is that is a great question. One of the reasons why one of the reasons why we decided to uh, study restaurants because uh, you know it, it is an important channel. Uh, it kind of, I mean, the, the, I mean, restaurant tours are also people, therefore they're also consumers. So we're hoping that we can uh, draw some lessons for, you know, for regular people who are not uh, restaurant tours as well. But we would be, we would be cautious uh, to generalize too far from that because, after all, uh, you know, uh, you know, the dynamics of, you know, because after all, you know, let's say if I'm consumer and I'm just buying wine for myself, my decision-making process is likely to be different than if I'm, you know. Of buying several cases of wine to sell to others, right? So, so yes and no. I think you know. So, so we 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 can generalize, but very cautiously, I guess.